God of War is one of the best designed games ever made. And I know that's a big statement. It is basically the gold standard of tons of different game design and level design patterns because of this, it is a fantastic game to really pull apart and analyse to see all the little tricks and techniques that developers use to create a cohesive experience for the player. And I have boiled a heap of this design down into this video so you don't have to. We are going to look at a bucket load of level design techniques by going through the first level of God of War. I'll explain each of the mechanics and its purpose as we come across it and show you where it's being used. Let's not waste any more time. Let's get straight into it. I'm starting the level after what we will call the opening cutscene. The player is taught to move prior to this during the opening cutscene, but this is the first time the player is going to start getting taught the core mechanics. Core mechanics are a set of actions that the player will be completing in the moment to moment gameplay over and over. So in God of War, the core mechanics include moving Kratos around, interacting with objects, combating enemies, throwing the axe, and getting Atreus to fire his bow. Every gameplay situation stems from a combination of these core mechanics. First of all, the player is given a goal. This is important because we want the player to have an idea about what they should do, and the player will be asking, what does the game want me to do? What are we hunting? You are hunting deer. Which way? In the direction of deer. Okay, uh, this way. In this case, Atreus is to hunt deer and Kratos will be accompanying him. God of War has a quest system, so we start with a quest that reads, Hunt with Atreus. Sweet, nice and tidy. Straight away, we are faced in the direction we need to go, and we can see a gate. I'm going to come back to this, but for now, we also have Atreus leading the way. The critical path is a term used to reference the path that the player is intended to take in order to continue. Sometimes the player must take this path. Most of the design effort will go into this critical path, as every player will see this content. There, unsurprisingly, is also non-critical paths, which can lead to other areas or extra content that isn't required to finish the game. This info will be important in just a second. Atreus shows us where to go by leading us along the critical path for the whole first section as we hunt. He will act systemically as our guide, and this will include everything in this video. Just outside the gate, we start to see these lanterns that create a path. Maybe the player notices them, maybe they don't. When we get to here, there are a few things happening. We have Atreus leading us down the critical path this way, but we have a lantern over here that might draw our attention. Light is one of the best ways to draw attention. It takes advantage of many psychological phenomena that humans have. In this case, it is sitting over here in a relatively dark part of the frame, drawing attention to this other path. Atreus also doesn't run this way, he runs here, as we continue forward, we also have this pickup item here. This is Hacksilver, which is strewn everywhere in God of War. It is used to buy upgrades in the game's skill tree and items at the stores. Here, it is being used, however, to push the player towards this other path. Had we have been following Atreus, we would have seen it and been tempted to pick it up, taking us in the direction of this non-critical path. As we round the corner, we see this little white interaction dot. This is called Spatial UI. Spatial UI appears in a spatially relevant position. This dot is saying at this point here, you can interact with something. And when you get close enough, it turns into a button prompt. There is a bit of room here so that players can trigger it and Kratos will move to the right place. This just makes interacting feel better than having to find the exact right spot to press circle. <coughs> Which are three. <coughs> now we get our reward for going down the side path. A little character development moment. I believe this is also communicating to the player that going off the beaten critical path will reward you, not only with goodies, but with scripted story content. It's just being upfront with that here, right at the start in the first level. Continuing on from here, we have a lit path and a not as lit path. Again, taking advantage of light to show the importance of the paths. Important, not as important. This path to the right leads down under this bridge for reference in a sec. Back on the critical path, we find a toy. Once again, conspicuously positioned to say, hey, look, might be a path down here. Following that path leads to a chest. Just a little goodie for exploring. This is also the destination for that unlit path from before. And we're starting to see that exploring will yield more rewards than just following the critical path. Speaking of critical path, let's get back on the critical path. Let's follow Atreus. We get to the top of the bridge and we come across a gap. This is our jump tutorial. 
It takes advantage of a pretty common design pattern where the player must demonstrate they understand and can use the mechanic before they continue. We'll see this with more relevance in a sec. Moving on, we have the same thing to vault over a log. In order to pass, you need to do the thing. But this demonstrates another technique you may not initially notice, the technique of taking away control on an action. This is usually so you can cut to a cutscene without the player being in a situation where the cut is going to be jarring, such as the player rolling through a doorway and then cutting to a cutscene where you are lazily strolling into the room instead. Cutting on an action means the cut is masked by the action and doesn't create a cognitive dissonance. We actually just saw this in the jump sequence too. Kratos jumps, the player loses control as soon as the button is pressed and is then forced to watch Atreus jump. Atreus ends up in front of Kratos, the camera is pointing in the right direction, the player gets their control back and it's all seamless. In the case of the vault, you can see where the camera jerks because they take away control a split second after the vault, then interpolate where the camera is pointing to where they want it to be. I must have just had my hand on the right stick pushing it across a little bit after that vault. Moving forward slightly, we have a similar scene to the last area. Atreus leads us down the critical path, but this pickup draws our attention this way, to the side path. Here, we see a technique I have covered on the channel before, framing. Shameless plug, it's one of my better videos. The fog makes it a tad hard to see, but the fallen tree, upright tree, and raised ground create a strong frame with this chest at its center. Once again, leading the player down the side path with the level design. After looting and getting back on the critical path, we're hit with another strong frame. We come around this corner. We see this bridge on the left and this hack silver on the right. The hack silver is in a dark area, so the bright color stands out and draws our attention. And the rocks, trees, this fallen branch and ledge create a strong frame that draws attention to the item by cutting down visual noise. Running over to pick this up, we are presented with two more techniques. The first technique is a vantage point putting the player in a high position that lets them survey the surrounding level, whether that's to work out where enemies are, for the player to get their bearings, or some other reason. There isn't a lot to survey here, so it's mostly to introduce some specific things to the player, which I don't know the technical industry accepted term for this, but I will call it foreshadowing in this video. This is where the developer shows the player something that they can't get to yet, but will be able to find later. It can be any amount of time later. God of War generally uses it to help players understand the levels and find secrets on the non-critical paths. So here we see a chain we can't reach, on a ledge that we can't reach, and also notice this light to help draw our attention. Also notice the chain has a camera frustum check of some sort to highlight when the player is looking at it, which is pretty tight. You'll notice as I look around, parts of the chain will glow or not glow depending on where I'm looking. Anyway, back to the bridge. I will point out the over-the-top bridge entryway once again for later. We go onto the bridge and the other side collapses, and Atreus blames it on the deer. But we are watching a level design video, so I think we know better than Atreus. It was not a magical blue antlered deer that made the bridge fall down. It was a well-placed trigger. It could be one of a few kinds, likely proximity or just a region that when entered triggers the bridge falling. By looking at the footage, I would say one of the ladder that spans the entrance to the bridge. We now have our first introduction to the axe. Just-in-time UI is a fairly old concept where the UI needed for something arrives just in time for the user to be able to take advantage of it. This is as opposed to something like the wall of text UI panel where you get taught about a mechanic and its functions before you use it or more than you need right now. God of War walks the player through throwing the axe with these just-in-time UI prompts. And here is where we will talk about something we mentioned earlier, forcing the player to demonstrate mechanics to continue. The player understanding how to throw the axe is basically required to play this game. The developers cannot risk the player going forward from this point without being absolutely sure that the player understands this mechanic. So a challenge that can only be completed by correctly executing the mechanic is put in the player's way. This isn't just for the start of games either. It is a good idea to do something like this every time you introduce a new mechanic. God of War is essentially a metroidvania, so you go through this process of demonstrating mechanics multiple times throughout the whole game. If the player throws the axe and breaks the barrier, this then allows them to jump across the gap. The dev can be sure that they know how to throw the axe. There is also a change in the reticle when the player is aiming at something the axe can interact with. And this gap helps the player understand throwing is the right answer, 
because you can't get close enough to these planks to hit them or punch them or run through them. Once we get across here, we get some story, 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 where we begin to spy some of the hard dad, disappointing son dynamic. I'm gonna keep glossing over the story parts and focus on the level design. I might make a video focusing on the story structure and the level pacing in the future. If that's something you would watch, drop a comment and let me know. We can cover the same gameplay sequence from a story structure point of view, and you will have this full encapsulated example. When we get control back, we're pretty much forced into the next section, which is the combat tutorial. This next part isn't strictly level design, but it's really unique UI design, so it's staying in the video. I am guessing the devs didn't want to break the tension of the moment by pausing the game to tell the players the controls. Now watch this. So we have the camera zoom to put Kratos on the left hand side of the frame. He draws the axe into center frame, which creates this strong leading line to the top right corner. The axe shines and draws the player's attention, then turns to ice. And what's that right over the top of it? Well, if it isn't the tutorial UI. What a wonderful way to use all of the elements that you have available to point the player to the tutorial and give them the best chance of finding it and reading it before they have to engage in combat while also maintaining the tension. This combat sequence is actually one of the hardest tutorial sequences I have ever played. These guys are pretty spongy and Kratos doesn't have tons of health, but the combat arena is simple and you need to defeat several enemies before you can continue and they spawn in gradually, so you only have to face two at a time. After defeating a few, you get introduced to evading and blocking through UI, which I don't love because I kind of hate it when I get given important information in the middle of trying to concentrate on something else. But Santa Monica Studios are geniuses, so I trust they felt this was the right way to do it. There is also a pause as the Draugr drag themselves out of the dirt. Now, moving on from combat, bearer of the critical path Atreus leads us forward. We have a soft frame here, leading up to a hard frame here, leading to a hard frame here. These frames are used to reduce visual clutter and direct the player's attention. This frame naturally draws your eye to the broken planks and this entrance. We also just did some combat, so it might not be a bad idea to teach the player how to get health back. Fairly empty space with a glowing green rock. And we get some just-in-time UI that hints at what this might be. We also see some established gamer shorthand. Green is health. You might say red is health, which I would agree, you're right. But red is Spartan rage in God of War, so green is the next best thing. It's also laying next to a corpse, so just some nice set dressing to tie in why it might be sitting here on the ground. Now this is a good time to talk about man-made architecture. One of the things that we have seen a few times now is the use of man-made architecture in places where it isn't really necessary. What I think is happening is the developers are using these pieces of architecture to make it clearer what is the critical path or what is important. This is where I'm going to finally jump back to the gate at the start. This may seem insignificant, but having defined structures like this does communicate to the player. Having a gate is a way of saying people pass through this area. It's not just a natural formation of rocks. It says that this path leads somewhere, otherwise they wouldn't have built a gate there. This adds another visual aid to Atreus, leading the way that confirms this is the direction we should be going. This is also a useful point of reference for players that might want to run around the first area and explore. They have a clear visual reference to find when they want to progress. And exploring the first area does yield a benefit. Just off to the right here is a pickup which goes towards a set of artifacts. This fits in with the toy that we found before on the critical path. We also spoke about this gate-like bridge from before. This way is the critical path. It almost acts like a door. So before I try to progress by jumping off this cliff, I might go through that other door first and see if there's anything there. And here it is being used to make it really clear that this is a crossroads with four exits. If this was just a clearing in a forest, it may be difficult to tell where you came from after exploring down one of these paths. This structure just makes it a bit more obvious. And you will notice that they all have a different marker. This one has X's, this one has a waving red flag, this one has a Atreus. If you want to stay on the critical path of this video, here's a timestamp, skip to here. Otherwise, I'm gonna quickly go over these two non-critical side paths because there are some nuggets of design worth mentioning. Let's go down the one with the strong framing first. Now, we see some familiar wooden planks. I wonder what we do with these. We know they break from back at the bridge. One of the things that games try to do is create a consistent visual language. Some games are better at it than others, mind you. So these planks look like the other planks, so we should be able to break them with our axe. 
Smashing them reveals in the center of our view these three glowing symbols. Is your interest peaked? Because that's what that placement is for. My interest is peaked. Entering the room introduces you to these rune chests. The game has a few varieties. This one will open if you find three seals. There is one to the right here. This is pretty much meant to be seen as you enter the chamber to prompt the player to interact with it. If we can get the player to hit this, they'll be able to notice the change in the runes on the chest. There's also one off to the left and one over here. Hmm, but you can't reach it to hit it with the ax. So we are getting taught that we can throw the ax to help us solve puzzles all while developing our prowess with the mechanics. We get a pickup that increases our health if we find three. We leave. Back at the crossroads, we will quickly cover the content with the red flag. I don't want to take up too much time with the side content. Let's head down here. I'm not 100% sure, but I think the fact that the other two paths have structures and this is literally off the beaten path is significant. Having not a trail and the path leading into the woods is subtly implying side content. So we jump down and now Atreus even lets us know where they're going the wrong way. Uh, here's this way. I can see more tracks. And I am the type to get really worried I'm going the wrong way. So I would have preferred something along the lines of, I thought we were hunting. I suppose we can explore a bit so you know you aren't doing something wrong. But that's, that's really a small nitpick. Or we can follow you. Moving further down, we get to here. This area on the left is well lit and we can see a sort of step formation going on. Everywhere else is pretty visually noisy. As we get closer, this pickup here becomes more visible. There is also this path on the right. It has a pickup drawing us down at two. If we go down here rather than climb the stairs, we come to this ledge. Hey, there's the bridge from before, which makes this the other ledge. And what do you know it? There's the chain we saw. So our foreshadowing from before has paid off, except we still can't get to it. This area is also another vantage point, letting us see down into the area below the chain. If you look closely, there is some hack silver here and a glowing orange thing there. This is another type of chest. We can now see that there's some fun things to bother going down there and getting. Right, let's go back and climb those stairs. Once again, the pickup draws our attention. Players like goodies. And as we make our way around, we finally get to the chain we saw before. There's the vantage point and there's the bridge. This whole time, we have been creating a mental map of the space. Some players are better at it than others, but having landmarks we already have visited in view allows us to get our bearings and fill in the holes in our mental model. Climb down the chain. Ah, wolves. Let's mop these suckers up. There's a chest here and some hack silver. And again, we get a few lines from Atreus and Kratos to help build the relationship between the two. These little story bits really help fill out the characters in God of War. There are tons of cool little father-son moments that you will miss if you are just following the critical path the entire game. And it gives the developers more chances to reward the player for exploring. On the way back, Atreus stays in front because he is our tutorial guide and he needs to show us where we need to go once we get back to the crossroads. Back here, there is a little secret if you are one of those few players that actually look up. It is pretty much a game dev meme that players never look up. But this factors into the design because if you want a player to see something or interact with something, in general, don't put it above their eye level. God of War will often reward players who diligently look around their surroundings with these hanging ceramic buckets that can be shattered or knocked down by throwing the axe. I also have a hunch that making players climb this ledge and putting this shaft of light to create some contrast like this helps players notice this one on their way back from the side path. Might as well also mention the changing reticle again. Also, similar to our chain from before, this disc that suspends the pot has a camera frustum check on it as well, so it glows blue when you are aiming near it. Okay, finally back on the critical path. So we head up this path with Atreus towards this old temple. The path itself is fairly narrow, and there is this bridge that swoops to the left. This helps keep the player looking in the right direction and creates leading lines to this scripted sequence where we see our prey go into the old temple. The camera zooms in to help control the player's attention on the action. On the right, we have a chest over here. This is another, everybody say it with me, vantage point. Yeah. Yep, if you were thinking foreshadowing, you are also right. Can't get to it yet, but we know to look for a way back down there later. Continuing along the raised path, we go up the stairs and through the door. Once again, cutting on an action to take away control of the player without it being jarring. 
Okay, we're now starting to get a bit of momentum going. I have laid down the groundwork and we are beginning to see techniques being used repeatedly so I can point them out and explain less. Some nice composition here and some story, story, story. Atreus goes to walk around Kratos, which motivates this camera movement, and we cleanly settle into control again, facing in the direction that we need to be going. We wander down some stairs and around a corner. Not much at all to see here. Then we get to this combat section. A tutorial dialogue pops up to add more depth to our understanding of the enemies, but just one thing at a time. We aren't being overloaded though. Also, the drag are waiting very patiently. Even this guy isn't getting involved yet. But once we attack, he jumps down and they all aggro to the player. Combat, combat, combat. I won't go into detail because combat design is a video in itself and these are fairly simple tutorial encounters. I will throw in a random fact though. When knocking these guys in the air, there is a maximum height that they can reach and will not go over, so the player can keep juggling them. Pretty cool. The devs almost always make sure there is a health stone either near or inside a combat encounter too so that players who are low on health have a decent chance, and if players lose health during combat, they have a chance to regain some. The health stone for this encounter is back here. I think its placement here is to heighten the chance that the players will see this giant door. Any idea where this leads? Let's find out. Oh, hey look, it's the chest. Oh no, more wolves. You'll notice from all the pickups that this venture out here was actually pretty lucrative. There was also this funny bit here. Some Draugr spawn after you kill the wolves, and I managed to hit this guy up on a rock, and he was all like, which I think means I will devour your firstborn. And then I hit him again, up against the level boundary, and he lands over here. And he still has some health, mind you. Hey buddy, you doing okay? You wanna talk about it? You just, just need a nap? Should I get Karen to talk to a manager? Oh, that's cool. Hey, you're busy. Hey, I'll call you. Let's head back inside. The place where we engaged in combat before is also a puzzle area. There is this chain here with an interaction dot that is demanding our attention. But the explorative player will also notice the side gate with a chest hidden behind it. Grabbing the chain, we get a little tutorial about how it works. The camera frames up exactly what we want to be looking at and pulling the chain moves these gates. You will notice one opens and one closes, and the devs even made sure that there was a second broken chain pillar so the two doors doing this makes a little bit more sense in world. One of the chains is broken. The player needs to work out how to get through the doorway. Once the gate is all the way up, we get a just in time tutorial reteaching the axe throwing mechanics. If we pull the axe out, we can see that we don't release the chain. Hmm, maybe we can throw the axe while the chain is up. Pointing the axe at this cog, it highlights blue. This is what happens when the player can throw the axe at something. This is the first time a player is seeing it if they are sticking to the critical path. And you will notice that the glowing area only occurs when the axe is aimed near this cog. Throwing the axe at the cog freezes it. And the game makes Kratos let go of the chain. So I'm not holding the chain, but the gate isn't going down? Ah, the gear must be frozen. Keen-eyed players will also notice that the gate to the chest on the right goes up when the main gate is lifted with the chain. This system is a closed loop, so if the player messes up, the puzzle just resets itself to the start. The player just needs to work out the solution, which is to run under this first gate, and then recall the axe, which will reset the puzzle, but now the player will be on the correct side of the gate, to just run through this now open second gate. So, we know a few things. We can interact with parts of the environment, we can use the axe to freeze parts of the environment. We can use the axe while interacting with parts of the environment. And recalling the axe will unfreeze the thing that it has frozen. And even just thinking about all of those four things by themselves, as a designer, implies a world of possibilities. Coming out of the gate, we once again see Atreus go one way and have something shiny in the other direction. What's that, like three or four times now? If we rotate the camera to go and look at it or go over to grab it, we have a good chance of noticing this chest. Again, the little hack silver pouch is used to drag us in a direction and show us something. Well, I'm not one to let a perfectly good chest go to waste, but here's the design wizardry. We open the chest, then turn around to go and find Atreus. Ooh, what's this? Another path and a highlighted chain. What's happening here is the developers are laying a trail of breadcrumbs so that when we go outside this gate, we turn around to explore the side path, which leads us to the rest of this temple. You could also call this a win because the temple already exists, 
So you may get some asset reuse here, and because we just went through all of the temple, it already relates to the player's mental map that they are consciously or unconsciously making. If we climb the chain, we get to here. There are some rocks that block this gate. There's a burning pot. If we try to smack the rocks, they don't break. But a really important point here is we have multiple types of feedback from the devs to let us know. Yes, you are hitting the rocks. We can see that. It's not doing anything. The sound accompanied with the spark and the flying rock chunks all tell the player that their action is being registered and the game is responding. And this helps the player come to the conclusion, the game is responding to what I'm doing. So this must not be the solution. We can also see another pot suspended from the other side of the gate. Now, this puzzle is its own little self-contained thing, complete with tutorials, challenge and reward. On the right here is these rocks and a pot. This is a mini tutorial. We don't know what these rocks do yet because they're new to the player. But if we throw the axe at the pot or if we hit it, it will explode and take the rocks along with it. This demonstrates the relationship between the two things. Similarly, on the left here, we have one of these hanging buckets. Remember that if the player has been on the critical path, while this is technically a side path, this may be the first time we have seen one of these. Although there have been at least two before, here and here. We also know that this blue glow, if from nothing else the gate, means that you can throw the axe. And throwing the axe at this disc would drop the pot like this. And you get some hack silver for your troubles. So all in this one section, we have been taught everything we need to know from scratch. The player should be able to work out now that throwing the axe through this gap into this glowing blue disc will drop this pot down and it should explode and destroy the rocks. This may seem like I'm going through too much detail for such a simple puzzle, but now, no matter what the player's skill level, they have been taught and allowed to take advantage of at least two mechanics and been rewarded for it. And they were taught all of that stuff no matter whether they missed this and came back to it, no matter whether they are good at games, whether they're bad at games, or whether they understand the mechanics or not. It has everything encapsulated in the one little space. And God of War does this mini tutorial thing all over the game. Even reintroducing already learned mechanics in a simple refresher tutorial before asking the player to apply them. Heading back to the chain, there is also this staircase. And as we approach it, we see this ledge on the left. This leads back to the previous area. But what is important about this ledge is that it has this really clear version of these markings. Markings in this style and color are used all over the world in God of War. They are used to highlight a place where Kratos can traverse. Similarly to ledge highlights in Tomb Raider and Naughty Dog games, they establish a visual language that tells the player, if I have one of these symbols on me, you can traverse here. And this language is stuck to pretty strictly. So if the player isn't sure where to go, they just have to look for some of these markings. We've actually seen them before, but I was waiting for a very obvious version of them to mention them. They previously were here on the jump tutorial, here on the bridge, faintly on this side path for the ledge that you can vault over, and here after this cutscene. They are also used for things like climbing routes and ledge walking later in the game. Now, about that staircase. Let's cruise up here. Ah, here we go. Speaking of visual languages, what do we do with these wooden planks again? They are also conveniently snapped so that we can see this distinctly well-lit thing at the end of the corridor behind them. Let's smash through them. Okay, cool. Our reward is a, a cupboard? Well, maybe something cool is in the cupboard. I'm being sarcastic, of course. These are kind of like God of War's audio diaries. They have three panels and the characters describe what the panels mean. And this fills in the mythology surrounding the world. I really like them, actually. That's all there is up here. Let's get back to the critical path. One, two, three, edit magic. Heading back up the critical path with Atreus, we round the corner and again transition into a cutscene. One of the few transitions that aren't on an action and we get to play this little mini game. This again isn't really level design related, but it is a really good example of how a game system can help explore a relationship in a way that is unique to only games. Kratos whispers in Atreus's ear as he lines up the shot, and you take down the majestic, completely innocent, likely endangered magical deer. Atreus is super jazzed. Kratos animates inside the cutscene to jump down here, I imagine that is a not so jarring way to prevent the player from just bailing at this point and turning around and heading back to where we were, which would kind of ruin the pacing of the scene. We run down and there is a really, really touching scene where Kratos has to help Atreus kill the animal. This is all story, story, story. 
but we now get a big spike of intensity as the deer is stolen by something crazy big and Atreus gets flung over the ledge, motivating Kratos to spur into action and ending up in this arena. Once again, ensuring the player isn't able to bail out during the boss fight. This does a number of things. The troll doesn't need multiple states for when Kratos is bailed, the level pacing and intensity curves are preserved, and we can now put everything that we have learned to the test, as well as now having access to Atreus' bow. A very simple tutorial begins introducing what Atreus can do. Shoot with square, you can aim the arrows, they will distract enemies. You have a limited amount, but they recharge. And we're off. This video is already really long, particularly in comparison to the ones that are normally on my channel. So I won't dig too much into the boss fight. It's a pretty blank boss arena, preventing Kratos from leaving with a mix of high walls and this cliff. The boss has a set of moves that require Kratos to dodge and then attack. There are only a few combinations to keep things simple for beginners who are just learning the mechanics. The arrows do essentially no damage, so the player can only utilize them as a tool to control the boss's attention. Do enough damage and you can trigger the kill. It's actually balanced really hard too. I died several times on my first playthrough. So you kill the troll and Atreus loses his cool, something fierce. Story, story, story. Back into the game, we technically just kill the deer and prove that Atreus can at least hunt. So our goal is complete. We're not hunting with Atreus anymore. So we get an updated goal of return to the house. A game should always keep the player in the loop of what the developer wants. We get out of the arena by climbing this ledge adorned with one of those markings I mentioned earlier. Had the player have run around the arena looking for the exit, they would have eventually seen this giant painting and hopefully investigated, which is important for an arena made entirely of very different landscapes. Here we have a trick that a lot of games use, where we cut down the viewing angle, take control of the camera, we teleport the player's companion behind them, and then initiate the animation. This means the companion can be anywhere and they won't pop into view. It will just seem like they were behind you the whole time. See this example. Just fought a tough boss and we are about to do more combat, so let's give the player their health back. But also notice the pacing. It was a pretty hard, big boss fight, so now the next combat encounter is going to be pretty chill. Next we get taught about the stun mechanic of combat. You'll also notice Kratos doesn't draw his axe. That way hopefully the player won't notice and you will use your fists instead, which will make the barehanded part of the tutorial make sense. We also get to see some cool animations if you actually fill up the stun bar and use a stun kill. Kill a few guys and we can move on. This encounter has its health stone in a barrel. I'm not sure whether this corpse broke the barrel or if it broke when combat ended to help the player find it. If we come over here, we see this mirror looking thing on the wall. We can interact with it and Atreus will kindly inform the player that this is a door that Kratos can't open. This hints at being able to open them in the future and that you will need to return later in order to get through. This subtly introduces the Metroidvania aspects that are tightly woven into this game. There are many things that you will come across like this that the player will need to pass by and return to later. You can't open everything from start to finish. Moving on, hey look, these markings won't lead us astray. Up here, we get a pretty standard affair to begin with. Health stone here, dragger around the place, combat, combat, combat. Once you kill the dragger though, we get introduced to this follower. And if you whack him with your axe, it bounces straight off. Maybe you remember that the Leviathan axe is imbued with ice. And this guy looks pretty cool. So we need to switch to our fists. This of course introduces the idea that certain enemies need to be handled in different ways. Not all attacks will work on everything. So we are still getting taught new things in each little section of the level. We break this and jump down here. And we are back at the hut where we started the level. We have come full circle in more ways than one. From here I want you guys to hit me with your feedback and if you want to see more kinds of these videos, because I think that's enough level design for now. I want to say thanks for sticking out to the end. This video took me a long time to make and I hope it's been useful or at the very least informative. Make sure to subscribe. And with that, I'll see you in the next one.